long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would teach us about the church. And over the next few weeks, as we look into this topic, that we would grow in our love and our affection for the local church and how we might be used of you to make it stronger. I pray, God, today that you would help me as I proclaim your word to be faithful to your scripture and bring you honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So over the last few weeks, we uh, discussed the existence of God and uh, good reasons to believe that there is a God. And we uh, concluded that there is a God, uh, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as revealed in Jesus Christ. And over the next few weeks, we're basically going to say, so what? So what if there is a God? What bearing does that have? What difference does that make if God exists? At best, 20% of of the American population has no faith. That means that they're atheist or agnostic, okay? That they either say that God does not exist or they say they just don't know. Uh, There's just not enough uh, facts for them, they say, to believe that there is a God. But if you do the math, that means that 80% of America has some kind of faith. And here's a remarkable thing. 73% of Americans proclaim or claim to be Christian. 73% of Americans claim to be Christians. Now, we might be encouraged by this, but I want to read a paragraph uh, from uh, the Barna Research Group. Here's what it says. Even though a majority of Americans identify as Christian and say religious faith is very important in their life, these these huge proportions belie the much smaller number of Americans who regularly practice their faith. When a variable like church attendance is added to the mix, a majority becomes the minority. When a self-identified Christian attends a religious service at least once a month, and says their faith is very important in their life, Barna considers that person a practicing Christian once a month. After applying these triangulations of affiliation, self-identification and practice, the numbers drop to around one in three U.S. adults, 31%, who fall under this classification. Barna researchers argue this represents a more accurate picture of Christian faith in America, one that reflects the reality of a secularizing nation. So they look at it and they say, okay, 73% of us say that we believe in God as it relates to the Christian faith, that we are Christians. But when you get right down to it, only a third actually attends church. Now for me, that, that is concerning. It's not as much concerning for our nation as my primary concern, just for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know how the story ends. If you read the back of this book, we win, okay? Uh, So we we know how it's going to end, but we still, I I believe, should be concerned about the state of the church in America. 
I'm concerned that our priorities and our passions are somewhat disordered, even perhaps for the 31%, because the reality is Jesus said many will come to him on that day and say, look at all we did in your name, and he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. So the 31% probably is not even an accurate number because we all know that just because your name is on a church membership roll does not mean that your name is on the membership roll in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that should be concerning to all of us. Why? Because of the importance of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you passionate about the church? Do you treasure the church of the living God? Are you being used in the church? Say, well, I've got a bad past. Read the Bible. Because just about anybody who does anything for God in the Bible has a riddled past. Except for Jesus Christ, who's the Son of God. Everybody else made mistakes. They had huge failings in their past. God used them. Say, well, I'm not gifted enough. Again, look at the Bible. Moses, he said, I can't go in to talk to Pharaoh. I've got this stuttering problem and so forth. God used Moses. Say, well, I'm too old. Just look at Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. Old, 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 maybe. Definitely to have a kid. I think we can all agree on that. What were they, like 80 to 100? That's old to have a kid at least. You say, well, I've made my contribution and, um, and maybe you think that you've done something in the past so now it's time for retirement. I want to read you a quote. You know, the, the retirement age in America is around 65-ish. And I want to read you a quote from a 65-plus-year-old man. Here's what he said. And see if you can identify who this person is was. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and on the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time the new world with all of its power and might steps forth to rescue and the liberation of the old. This is Winston Churchill, and he was 65 years old when he made that statement. So I don't care whether you have a riddled past, I don't care whether you think you're not gifted, and I don't care whether you think you're too old. I want you to know something. God's not done with you. God wants to use you. His desire, I believe, is to use each and every one of us, not just to save us from hell, but to save us to something. The point of being a follower of Jesus Christ is suddenly you've re recognized and discovered the ultimate purpose for life. And so today we want to talk about that as it relates to the church. As I read that uh, quote from Winston Churchill, I see here's a man who's looking for a fight. I mean, folks, I don't know if you know it, you know, we, we can't obviously see the spiritual realm, but there is a war going on in this world, and we are called to participate in it. So let's look at today, I want to give you four biblical images to grasp the church, four biblical images to grasp the church. You know, our mission is to show the world the way, the truth, and the life of Jesus. That's what we are called to do. That's kind of our take on the mission of God as it relates to us. And so today we're just going to talk about uh, how the Bible describes the church, uses these images, uses a lot of images. I'm going to talk about four main images today that I think as we grasp these images, we grasp what the church is. Image number one, the people of God. The people of God. I want you to notice in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is a reminder to us all of our distinct identity as it relates to the Lord Jesus Christ. God is reminding us who we are and the importance of our mission and our task. Um, I believe it's important for us to hear this. These are words of encouragement because there's so much discouragement out there in the world. It's important for us as believers in Jesus Christ to be reminded of who we are and what we are about. And so he gives us these, this distinct identity. I want you to notice these identity markers he lines out here. He's quoting, by the way, or alluding at least to the Old Testament. Notice these. Let's break it down. A chosen race. Turn over with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. And verse 5. Exodus 19, verse 5. He says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God is giving Moses the words that he is to take to the people of Israel. And the reality is he's saying to them, you are my treasured possession. So when he says you are a chosen race, the key point to be made here is how we are treasured by God. Chosen in the context of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 relates to us being precious in the sight of God. We are valuable to him. God cares about us. We are made in the image of of God. Notice it also says in 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 4 and 5 and following, that we are a royal priesthood. So we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. What does this mean? It means that we represent God. Hear, hear me on this. It means that we're royalty. We belong to the king's family. We are kingdom and priests to our God made in the image of God to follow after him. Notice it also says that we are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. But notice how it ends by saying we are the people of God. Now I want you to turn one more time to the Old Testament book of Hosea. Hosea. Chapter 2. And verse 16. Hosea chapter 2, verse 16, page 752 in my Bible. Um, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me, listen to, the, listen to this language, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and the creeping things on the ground. I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. This is the word of God that he's speaking to them and he's saying that you're not my people you shall be my people I will adopt you you will I will betroth you you will be part of the family of God what makes someone not part of the family of God is their unfaithfulness Okay, so they have rejected God, they've uh, committed idolatry, they've gone their own way but notice how he speaks of them I will Make you, you're saying that you're my Baal, I'm going to make you say you are my God. Being the people of God is about worshiping God. Notice that transition there. I want us to be reproved by all of this because we need to understand that if we're the people of the living God, if that's true of what it says about the church, it means that this is a divinely established institution. This is not a human institution. This is a divinely established institution. But it also means that for the people of God that our identity is rooted in community. We're not a cluster of individuals here. Okay, this is not about as I walk into the church, it's about my preferences and what I want. Ultimately, we are a community, we are a people, we are a body of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Which brings us to our next point this morning, the body of Christ. Image number two, the body of Christ. This is, in the New Testament, one of the primary images Paul uses to describe the church, that we are the body of Christ. When Paul went about the ancient world and he was persecuting the church, uh, Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I want you to notice the connection between persecuting the body of Christ and Jesus. He said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Over in Romans chapter 12, he draws out this image of the body of Christ. He says in Romans 12 verse 3, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith That God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, the one who teaches in teaching, the one who exhorts in exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Notice we are members of one another. This was not a word membership. This concept of being a member is not a word that a pastor just came up with just so we would all feel obligated to show up on Sunday morning. Okay, This is a concept rooted in the Bible that we are members, literally limbs of one another. We are connected to one another, and this is called the body of Jesus Christ. And the church is not some abstract theological idea. You want to know what the church is? Look to your left, look to your right. The church is not a building, it's a people, remember. People sitting next to you, they have names, they have faces, they have Emotions, they have struggles, they have good days, they have bad days. The church is a people representing the body of Christ. It's not just some abstract theological idea that they teach in seminary. It's human beings. And guess what? There are not rogue members. The Bible has, you know, we have this category today where we say active and inactive members. Can I just tell you something? The Bible never makes that distinction. There's members. And as we just read in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 and following, to be a member is to be active. That's what what it looks like. We are demonstrating the reality of who God is. People say, well, I can just hang out in my deer stand and meet with God there. Well, I can be honest with you, that's about all I do when I go out and sit in a deer stand. But, okay, I certainly don't meet with any deer. Um, (laughs) But what makes you think that God's going to want to hang out with you in a deer stand if you don't want to hang out with his bride? What makes you, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think he's going to meet with you. I don't think it's going to be a meeting you want to be at. Because it's going to be very confrontational. Why are you letting my church suffer for lack of volunteers, for lack of people serving while you sit in a deer stand? Why you live your life the way you want to live your life is not a conversation I think that you really want to have with God. Because this is the body of Christ. What you do to this church represents what you are doing and how you think of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't make that distinction. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jared, why are you not active in the body of Christ? Why are you treating my son this way? This is how the Bible speaks of the church. Why are you neglecting my children? The body of Christ is a working body. Look again at Romans 12, 3 and following. You got gifts. Everybody does. And so far as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he has gifted you to serve, to act, to work within the body of Christ. And whatever gift you have, he says, use it to make the body strong. As I say in my... um, membership class that we have quarterly. I say, you know, none, none of us are the head of the body. So you, your activity is not going to destroy or not destroy the body of Christ because Jesus is the head of the body. But we are members of the body. And you can make a local church stronger or weaker by your activity or lack thereof. 
And so God has gifted each one of us to serve in the body of Christ. Image number three, the temple of the living God. And I want to turn back to 1 Peter 2. I want you to notice how he describes us in 1 Peter 2, verse 4. He says that we are living stones. He says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is a description of a temple of a spiritual house, and we are all stones within that building, metaphorically speaking. I want you to understand something. The ultimate identity marker for the church is the Spirit of God. That's what makes a church a church. Now, I'm in disagreement with someone who said, well, no, it's the ordinances and it's preaching. That's important, and I think if you've got a church, those things are going to happen, but listen to me. In the Bible, what makes... The church, the church, is the presence of God. That's what makes a church a church. We are, the word church, ecclesia, we are called out ones, called to be holy, called to follow Him. We are a people, we are the body of Christ, but we are the temple of the living God where the Spirit of God dwells. The ultimate identity marker for the church is the Spirit of God. And I want you to notice in the Bible the central place of worship for God's people has always been the place where God's Spirit dwelt. The tabernacle, the temple. When Jesus was on the scene, that's the central place. Jesus himself said, what did he say? He said, tear down this temple and I will will rebuild it in three days. He was referring to himself. He was referring to himself and we are told by Peter and Paul that each One of us are living stones. We are bound to the cornerstone that's rejected by the world. And we now exist as a spiritual house. So what was the point of the tabernacle and temple in the Old Testament? It was a shadow of what was yet to come. That was the point of it. It's a shadow. It's not the ultimate substance. In Jerusalem right now, they have what they call the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall, where people gather to this day to mourn the destruction of the temple built by Herod. And to this day, people still await the prophetic fulfillment of the new temple. The world is captivated by this conversation. I want to say two things about it. First, can anybody show me in the Bible, as we think about the old temple that Herod built, can anybody show me in the Bible where it records the Spirit of God filling Herod's temple? There are examples of the tabernacle, Exodus chapter 40. There are examples of the first temple, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10. There's not an example like that of Herod's temple. You see, these are shadows of the reality yet to come. Second, I want want you to understand this. If they built that temple, a lot of us, we love prophecy. We we love stuff like that, and that's good. I I think that in its place is healthy and good. But if they built a new temple this year, for all its prophetic significance, I want you to hear me on this. Do you think it would be of greater value and replace the significance of the church of the living God. Turn over with me, if you would, to um, first, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. I want you to listen to Paul's description of the church. And I'm using this analogy because I want you to understand how important it is what we are doing right now. In Second Corinthians chapter six, verse. 16, he writes, What agreement has the temple of God with the idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me. He says the same kinds of things over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. My point in all of this is to say that we should be passionate about the local church. If people will travel from all over the world to mourn the destruction of Herod's temple, where it's not recorded in the Bible that the Spirit of God even filled Herod's temple, how much more passionate should we be about the local body of Christ? 
It's the body of Christ. It's the temple of the living God. This is important. We should pour our lives out for the sake of the church of God. Image number four, and we wrap it up with this new creation. New creation. First Peter alludes to this. He says that we are like uh, newborn infants. There's this concept that we've been born again. We've been made into a new uh, creation. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul calls us a new creation of God. It says the same over in James 1, 18. Believers in Jesus Christ are the first installment of God's new creation. The heavenly reality... What's going on in heaven should be reflected in the culture of a church. I just want you to think about that. What do you imagine heaven is like? By the way, this is our prayer. That this, this should be, if you want to talk about prayer requests and things like that, this should be your ultimate prayer request, your ultimate prayer. You want to know what it is? Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This should be our prayer. Should be what wakes us up in the morning, what drives us through the day, and what puts us down at nighttime to rest. Because our sole passion in life ought to be for that heavenly reality to be reflected in our own lives and in our own churches. Churches are a colony of heaven. So uh, imagine colonies. You know, uh, the, uh, here before too long, we're going to do a series in Philippians, okay? And one of my favorite books in the Bible. And in Philippians, he says that we should live out our citizenship worthy of the gospel. He says that our citizenship is in heaven and we await a savior from there. Philippi was a Roman colony. So this is where a lot of uh, veterans in that day uh, of the Roman Empire, they would retire and they would go and live in Philippi. Okay, And so even though this was a good bit away from Rome, it, was still, it still had the culture, it still had the values, it still had uh, kind of the shape and the form of the Roman Empire. And he's making this point that our citizenship is in heaven and we await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that should be reflected in the culture of our churches and how we live our life. Do you know that the Bible says that we are the first fruits of what is yet to come? That we have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. We are the first installment of that new creation that God is going to make. So people ought to be able to walk through the doors of this church and walk into this room and feel the newness of this culture, fill the heaven here. Now, obviously, we're never going to totally get there until Jesus returns. Obviously, that's true. But we should be headed there. That should be our trajectory. That should be where we're going because why? You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And either that's true or it's false. But if it's true, that means, guess what? You are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And people ought to be able to see that in your life, and insofar as we have a whole bunch of new creation people in this room, people ought to be able to observe that when they walk in the doors of this church. What does that look like? In heaven, what do you, what do you imagine that they're doing right now? They're worshiping, right? You think anybody up there is complaining about not getting the song that they wanted, son? Think a soul in heaven's doing that? Don't think so. You know why? Because they're worshiping God. They're fascinated with the one who is most fascinating. What else do you think is going on in heaven? Well, there's a community, right? They are together. There's not this guy up in heaven saying, you know, I think I'm going to go over here by myself because I just can't stand to be around you folks. No, they're, they're together. Revelation 4 and 5, what do you see? You see them together, and they are solely unified, worshiping God and I bet there's a kindness in heaven. I bet there's a sweetness there. I bet there is, I bet the love is thick in heaven. You know, just imagine what heaven is like and pray for that reality to be manifested in your own behaviors, in your own life, 
in the life of this church. That's my prayer. Now, I want to end by saying this. This message, I do pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit in all things for myself and for each and every one of us. This message, I pray, is to draw us in to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to pour my life out for the sake of the church because this, if you want to demonstrate your love for Jesus, it can be demonstrated in the local church because this is the body of Christ. So are, whatever gift you have, are you, using, are you using it? Are you serving? Are you making this church stronger?